Howdy folks, this is episode 22 of Retsu Talk. How is it going, Beef Man? What's going on, dude? Oh, you know, not too much. I, you know, read the I Have No Mouth short story. I'm feeling yeah. pretty good about that. Educated myself a bit. What? How? Did the I Have No Mouth short story make a sound somehow? <laughs> it did. That was the uh, little sound effect I'm putting in. I'm turning this into a morning radio show kind of podcast. In 1967, that's how they voiced Anne, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. That's exactly. <laughs> uh, PAX was a month ago. You've been doing some real-life bullshit. I have. We've been playing video games. It's been crazy. I know. We have a lot to talk about. Where do we even begin? Um, Why don't we start from the beginning? Okay. Which, in our case, would be uh, the PAX debrief. That's how I feel where my life began after all mm -hmm. this, more or less. Um, one cool thing that happened... Well, a couple of cool things that happened after we did our... What was it? Post-Day 2 podcast? Day 2 debrief, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Zealous, who is basically the most awesome guy ever, gave me this uh, 999 watch. That was really awesome, actually. It really was. Not even knowing much about the game, but just him suddenly having that, saying, like, here, have this. Yeah, he was just like, thanks for your work on police knots and shit, and like, here, have this thing. And it was like the digital watch, it had like the sort of, um, same kind of like bracelet armband as the game and stuff. It had a latch so you could take it off, and it didn't really lethally inject you or kill you or blow up or anything. So there is that, I mean. There is, absolutely. Yeah, thanks a lot, Zealous, whatever, you know. And then also that same evening, uh, Johnny, was, who was one of the fellas we met and chatted with and who was on the PAX Day 2 debrief, uh, he's friends with Frank Howley, who uh, hangs out with the Mega64 guys a lot, and he just went and grabbed him and brought him by our room just to chat for a little bit, say hi. Yeah. And then we went to their room for a little bit, which was odd. <laughs> it was very odd. Um Mega64 happened, I guess, or maybe just one or two members or just one, happened to be on the same floor in the same hotel as us. So we just like, walked across the hall and um, I, was, I I can't say met one of them. He sort of just like nodded to me when I waved to him. You yeah, know? I was just kind of like, hey, how's it going? Yeah, basically. And then we kind of had sidebar conversations with other people in the room. Yeah, basically. And I, I felt kind of awkward like, yeah, I think I'm intruding on the Mega64 party here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so. it was like it was like two or three in the morning. I forget, but you know, it wasn't so much of a party. But it was it was kind of weird and surreal. I don't know. Well, everybody was kind of drunk and just hanging out and spouting, you know, drunken conversation. That was pretty much it. Yeah, but it was still a very very odd experience um, in a good way, mind you. If don't get me wrong. Sure, sure, sure. Definitely. Yeah. Pat so those were things that were not covered previously, and then the next day we uh, left. Mm hmm. PAX was an incredible time. I'm sorry I can't go to PAX Prime, you know. Yeah, we had talked about maybe pitching. Uh, we had the panel idea, kind of. We were wishy-washy at first, and then we were like, well, you know, if we can apply for it, let's do it. But PAX Prime is just kind of too far away and cost-prohibitive to travel to the West Coast a little bit for uh, for both of us. And I hear that. I, I think for me, it, it, it's it's cost-prohibitive, and we'll talk about some of the things that have been happening in my life that make it cost-prohibitive. That said, I'm still holding out hope. I'm sure you... I mean, that we can go to PAX East 2014 and do a panel there. I would I would definitely like to submit a panel idea there and, and possibly uh, get that going. Mm-hmm. So if anybody knows how to apply for panels, because not really clear on how that works, but I figure we'll give it a shot. We'll pitch an idea, see if they like it. We'll go regardless, probably. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, well, I mean, the way I, I when I looked it up, apparently you email them and you kind of pitch your idea to someone. It's okay. The idea. Yeah. So. Um, so we have to really sell it then in text form. Exactly. Yeah, and I, and I think I think we could do that. I think if it's not on Retsu Prey, it might be on Let's Play in general. Who knows? Interactivity by proxy, whatever you want to call it. Bang, video games, boom. Yeah. I'm an agent. Put a picture up of Mike Dawson. Don't you think this guy should be made fun of? <laughs> I mean, look at this loser. I mean, we could do it. We could do a four hour, four hour panel on that, surely. Absolutely, but. no problem. <laughs> you know, one thing I will say. Um, it was a little weird. We got um, we got front row seats to Proton John's Throne Controllers panel, <laughs> <laughs> which was a very odd experience. Um, VIP. VIP. No, um, I don't know. Thinking back on it, I think we probably, I don't know. 
we, we can hang back next time, I think. I was. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Though so, uh, it was completely filled this time. Absolutely. Yeah, so you actually had to get in line kind of early to even get in in the first place. My, my feeling on the matter was, you know, last year we made a video on it, so I'm like, I want to get front row, I want to get good camera work going, you know, I want to get some good perspective there, yeah. but in the end of the day, I mean... Yeah, but by a year later after the first panel, John and the guys kind of had a chance to iron out their tech issues, so the technically speaking, the panel went, you know, relatively smoothly, so there wasn't as much to make make fun of as there was last year, so I, I was kind of content with just kind of tweeting about it and... There are only 99 out of 100 problems. After no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> no, absolutely. No, uh, yeah, I, I think next year we'll just hang back with, like, everybody who was hanging out with us and stuff. I, I felt kind of bad about that, honestly. But um, Yeah. Make it more of a community experience. Absolutely. I think that's a better way to do it, you know. Mm -hmm. Whatever. You know, you, it's hard in that wild PAX world. But enough of PAX. That's past news. That's gone. That's garbage. That's past us. In the past month, you've been a busy feller. Mm-hmm. In fact, you are moving as of this recording on Sunday? Mm-hmm. In a couple um, of days' time? As of Friday, April uh, 19th, I am a homeowner. I own a home. Yay. I know. I can see, I can see you clapping, by the way. We've decided to do this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I forgot to mention that. So... Um, some of the feedback we got from the PAX podcast is that it went really well, so, and I thought part of it might be that we get to, like, sort of act off each other when we're, like, talking in real life, although I can see... Lots of gesturing that you can't do normally. <laughs> yeah, basically. That seeing each other allows you to do. You're just kind of rotating your hands right now, it's not working. I'm rotating right. the Right, well, you were doing the swivel in the chair thing. <laughs> I'm not in a chair, I'm standing. Oh, you're standing up. Yeah, you're not even watching what that's, the That's I'm incredible, watching. yeah. Completely it's strange how you're able to just float like that. Well, maybe it is. Here, let's rotate the camera down a little. Oh, oh not... okay, don't do that. Okay, that's like... I, I, I can see one. Anywho, yes, I uh, I now own a home in northern New Jersey. Um, we're going to move in on Sunday. That's the big move day when we do all our furniture and shit. Um, mm -hmm. But dear God, what a fucking nightmare buying a home in the Tri-State area is. Never do you really it. We need to buy a home in the South. Anybody can buy a home in the South. They're cheap as hell. Uh, it can't be. It can't be any worse than this experience. You can't believe the documentation you have to provide, and all the stuff you have to do. It's crazy mm -hmm. talk. It's crazy. Proof town. that you've watched the Jersey Shore within the past three years. You have to watch like three kind of DVDs of it and show receipts that you bought those DVDs and recordings right. of you watching them, more or less. Yeah, and if spray tan ballers aren't falling out of your bag, then just forget it. Walk. What I said, by the way, just now was a joke, but it's more along the lines of three out of the 18 things you have to do before appraisal. <laughs> it's a fucking nightmare. I, I'm, I told my wife and I told my uh, in-laws, like, I'm going to die in that fucking house because I will never goddamn buy a house again. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a goddamn nightmare. So if you resigned yourself to being in northern New Jersey for the rest of your life. You know, I have. Um, but I like it. Yeah. I mean, wow. my, my family's here, all that stuff. But here's the good news, okay? I can I can now scream in my Let's Plays and not worry about waking up the neighbors. Despite the fact that you have no mouth? <laughs> Transition time! Or did I jump the gun on that transition? Do you want to bitch more about home ownership? No, I, I can't. I'll, yeah, I'll take up the whole hour. Let's go into uh, topics the viewers do care about. Uh, do viewers care about topics? Are, are they really viewers as opposed to listeners? Well, listeners... Know. Who cares? Let's go down to I Have No Mouth. We just finished that wrong parade. Yeah, and I decided to read the short story after the fact to uh, compare and contrast and be ready for this exciting conversation. I've read the short story a few times, actually. It's one of my favorites. It's it's good read. It's good I think read. so, absolutely. Ellison's kind of a, a dick in real life, apparently, but he is a right. monster of a writer. And I noted uh, the game, the more I read the story, the more I thought, this game is very tangentially related to <laughs> the story. They, they, they sort of take the basic idea and mm -hmm. then try and make it their own, I There's guess. There's some similarities here and there, like Benny's kind of a monkey person mm -hmm. that was imported... It's about it for Benny. There was the Chinese-Russian thing. 
There was also a Yankee AM, which I was pleasantly surprised to see. Well, I mean, technically that's a Like, hey, I'm torturing you! <laughs> Is that how you see Yankee AM as a New Yorker? Well, it's a Yankee, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. New, there is that. New, as in the New York Yankees? It's, uh, being a northerner, I always read that as sort of the American ham, but I see where you're No, no, as there. a southerner, I read that as the cultural northeast. <laughs> where you guys are dicks and push people in traffic and wear fancy suits and <laughs> well, pay $2,000 plus dollars for an apartment for some reason. <laughs> we are that way, granted. God, 2000 plus. My my friends in New York are playing like three thousand plus. It's crazy. Oh well, okay. Yeah, no, there is that. No. See, I <laughs> underestimate your shitty cost of living. <laughs> it is very shitty, to be fair. Yes. Um. Yeah, it, it's weird because ever since the the wrong price started, I've been reading a lot about the game, and I started playing it at one point because I think we mentioned this already. Like the long plays graphics kind of weren't up to par. The audio was out of sync. Blah blah blah. Um, right. And I started to want to do a Let's Play of it on my own, but I have, I have studied a lot of I Have No Mouth and I No Scream in the past couple of months. Yeah, I can, I can tell you all the differences, but, like, Benny, um, probably a good starting point, he's, he's gay in the short story, and reading all the interviews, no one can quite remember why they turned him straight. Well, that was a thing. It said... Like, Ted was explaining... Ted is the narrator in the short story. Right. And he was explaining how Am changed Benny. <laughs> yeah. And he just kind of offhandedly mentioned, and Benny's got a horse-sized cock now. Well, that's the So weird. sucks for him not being gay anymore. <laughs> yeah, right. It, it was... Now that he's got a huge slong. It's totally weird in the short story, because he has these <laughs> contrasts where, like, Benny was handsome, Am ruined that by making him a monkey, and he was really an intelligent, um, a theorist and a professor, if I remember correctly... And Am, oh no, he was lucid, Am drove him mad. And then it was like, and he was gay, but Am gave him a huge dick. And it's like, wait, how it's did like, that... wait, hang on. Yeah, wait, why did that fuck him up? I, I don't know. I mean... <laughs> and Benny was gay, so Am, I don't know, gave him some coffee, made him wired all the time. I don't know, something unrelated. Uh, yeah, Nelson I... was really inspired for a streak and then got to the cock thing. was like, ah, oh, uh, yeah, straight. I really don't know where Ellison was going on that one. I guess, I don't know. I, I was very confused, because it was just kind of mentioned out of nowhere and then never <laughs> brought it... Well, it was mentioned twice. Right. It was mentioned it was mentioned once in the context of he's not uh, gay anymore because they gave him a huge dick. Then it's mentioned again that he's got a huge dick and Ellen really likes it. Yeah, right? And that's... It's like, what? Ellen's... And it feeds into how Am impacted her to some degree. Like, she was kind of a mostly pure kind of yeah. lady, and then he corrupted her into... It, it gave her pleasure, but it wasn't nice to do, if I remember right. And it's, it is it, it is kind of like a thing where I think he, like, somehow biologically or hormonally increased her sexuality yeah. to a point... She, I don't know if she was comfortable with or didn't like or something, but um, it, it's really weird because, again, like... You know, like, she, he goes into, like, how um, Ellen loves that Benny is now big in the privates. I think that's a quote, actually, you know? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, so I, I don't quite get what Ellison thinks of big dicks or whatever. You know, I've seen a lot of porno. I know they're supposed to be mm -hmm. better. But I, I would have thought the gays would have liked it, too. I don't know. I'm just saying. Well, that's how you refer to them nowadays, right? The gays? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's the PC mm -hmm. term. Okay, just making sure. Hey, Yankee Am would know that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You were you were big on. They mentioned not only the Chinese and the Russian Am, like in the game, but the Yankee Am in the short story. As a Northerner, I always read that as just American Am. But hey, um, mm -hmm. you, I guess you Southerners are like we don't want no part of this uh, Am creature or whatever. Well, you know, it just means different things to different people, and that's what the short story is all about. I think so. I think so. Well, Ellen's, Ellen's a very weird character in the short story because you only really get a, um, Ted's perspective on her, you know? Right. And, and he's very schizophrenic about it, you know? Yeah, like, they, well, they mentioned at one point Ellen is carried by all four of the dudes... Toward the beginning, and I read right? that as kind of like, oh, she's gonna. They want her to be alive to make sure that the species can be repopulated or something. That's how I read it at first. That's how I read it too. Like they're holding out some ridiculous, mind you, hope that right. maybe they can overcome Am and keep her alive. To sort of, yeah, start humanity again. Even yeah, that which is. possibly that was the purpose of Benny's horse cock. <laughs> 
Perhaps. I guess, I guess Maybe so. that's what they were thinking. I don't know. <laughs> and Betty was potent. You could chew his sperm. It was crazy. No, um... <laughs> But it is weird, right? He peed boiled boar urine from that giant cock. <laughs> um, no, it, it, it's odd, too, right? Because y- you also don't get a great feel from the short story about how Ted feels about Ellen. Because he'll kind of go back and forth, and he's like... You know, I remember, like, Ellen the Pure, Ellen the Pristine, scum filth. You know what I mean? Like, he kind of <laughs> has this weird love-hate relationship for her that's hard to eloquate. Which I like about the short story, mind yeah. you. You know? Sure. And then, spoilers, he kills her in the end. But she kind of, well, wants him to. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. situation, you know? I, just, I find it hard to believe that in 109 years, they had never had the idea to just, or never wanted to just murder each other. <laughs> you, you know, it's funny, and that comes up in the, I feel like that comes up in the video game, too. It's just that, like, after a fucking century, it's like, you never really thought of this. And, like, even in the game, um, the, the other Ams, the Chinese and the Russians, bring up, like, Ams playing a dangerous game, not just to you, but to himself, too. And it's like, so this is the first time he's played a game with them? That How that's working? Okay, you say so. You know. That's another big part where the uh, story differs from the game, is that in the game, the... Or, uh, I'm sorry, in the story, the one of the Ams absor- already absorbed the other two. Mm-hmm. And the game, they're just all kind of separate. Like, Yankee Am is apparently the one torturing them. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, you dicks! Yeah, give me! You know, saying Yankee shit, and then... <laughs> is that how us, we talk, the Northerners? That's how I hear any Yankee that ever talks. Might as well be. It is, yeah. Um, well, you know the tricky thing is, when we made fun of this, like, a lot of people on YouTube defended the game. I didn't realize it had such a big following, but apparently... It was one of the first video games that were art. Uh, sure, okay. Um, here's what, all right, actually, reading a lot of interviews and the development of the game, here's what I really think happened, right? All right. Um, I don't know the origin of it, but somehow Cyber Dreams and Ellison were talking, and Ellison, I think, brought up, why don't we make I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream into a video game? Oh, so, that was his idea. I uh, More or less, because the interviews I've read are from David Sears, the second writer's perspective. And he was a guy who wrote for a PC magazine. I don't remember the name. He just wrote articles. He never wrote a video game before. So what happens is um, he's approached by Cyber Dreams to write a video game. He always wanted to, so he's down with it. And, he, and they're like, we want, we want to write an Ellison short story into a video game. And he's, he was a big fan of Ellison, thought of all these ideas, and they're like, it's I have no mouth and I must scream. And he's like, that's the worst idea I've ever heard. You know. Well, um, yeah, when you read the short story, and I was reading that, you know, having watched the video game before... I just thought, how? Why did they want to make this into a game? Here's the thing: as much as, and I and I do diss this game a lot, I have to give Cyber Dreams credit. They 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 had a really bold idea, especially yeah. in 1995. You know, this I mean, uh, and and I can only liken it to Pathologic by Ice Pick Studios, where it's this game that's not by design, mind you, not fun to play. You're intended to feel really fucking bad after this game, no matter how it goes, right? Um, anyway, Sears, yeah, Sears' reaction was kind of similar to yours, which is like, how the fuck do you make this into a video game? That's ridiculous, you know? So, he meets up with Ellison, who's supposed to have this ornery reputation, and apparently he asks Ellison this question, which no one had ever asked him about the short story, is, why these five people? And Ellison's like, that's a really good question. I never even thought about that. And that's, they decide the game has to be built in five vignettes or whatever, right? Okay. And that's kind of the, the, the idea behind the game. They present their document to Cyber Dreams, who says, this is not a game design document. We're going to send one of our game designers, this guy David Mollick, over to you, and he's going to help you draft a real deal game script. Um, Ellison and Mollick have a bad first meeting, which Ellison kind of sarcastically says to Mollick, like, oh, look, another member of the brain trust from Cyber Dreams. Because he, like, he couldn't find, like, an electrical socket or something. But then he gave the hate speech to him. So here's so here's the deal. From 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 the interviews I've read, I do blame Cyber Dreams for the game's failings. I think they were pretty terrible adventure game designers. Um, I think they 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 kind of conflated um, taking things a player wouldn't first think of wouldn't think of normally as good puzzles, and you can see yeah. this in the Dark Sea games more or less, right? Where you like. You, you tie a rope around a gargoyle and climb down the side of your house to avoid a policeman two days later? 
You know what I mean? Like, that's a crazy stupid puzzle. And um, in the interviews, so if you look at Goris, your scenario, right? When they're writing it out, Ellison has the suggestion of, you know, Edna, remember Edna, the mother-in-law, she's hanging on the hook and all that shit? Of course. Um, Ellison's suggestion is like, look, metaphorically, Gorister wants to forgive her, so he lets her off the hook. And they sort of, they're sort of telling like, Harlan, that's the first thing the player's going to think of. Which is fair, but then their solution is like, well, you tie her up, and then you take her in your inventory, and then you hook her up to a Zeppelin to power it. Which is like, no, that's not that's not a good puzzle. Oh, great, you wouldn't think of that, but that's not a fucking good Put idea. her in his inventory? <laughs> and Ellison, I guess, was just like, okay, I guess that's how video games work, blah, 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 you know. Um, <laughs> Only an allied master computer could come up with such a scenario. <laughs> Um, and and uh, another complaint we got about it, too, is that, like, the notion was these psychodramas are supposed to be surreal and crazy, which is kind of okay, but I feel like to make a good adventure well, game, they have I to mean, be... The, yeah. The puzzles have to make some sort of sense for the player to execute the game properly. Absolutely. They, they at least have to be consistent within their own world and follow yeah. their own rules, you know? There has to be some kind of logic to them in order for you to actually play the game successfully. Gorgeous your scenario, I think, is a good example of it, because in the same world, you can't have someone metaphorically accidentally kill a bunch of animals and then literally wipe their hands on tablecloth and have that somehow, like, exonerate them from their guilt, but then later take their mother-in-law and hook her up to a blimp, like, and have the thing, like, inject itself into her goddamn brains and fix that. And then blow up a honky-tonk and... Ah, uh, my head. You know, like, it's... Well, I'm glad my morality don't make no sense. I'm glad it don't make it. <laughs> I, I was hoping to kill myself, but Am's mind broken me. Gorster did not strike me as Southern in the short story. <laughs> no, no, no. That, that in fact, none of the characters were really that drawn out, except for maybe for Benny in his past life, which was explained, and he's now turned into, like, a, a Neanderthal-type person. I really like the way the short story did it. Um, yeah, Benny, I feel like, is... Yeah, he's the most... Mm, for lack of a better term. Changed? Per yeah, perverted, I was going to say, by Am, mm. from his former self. We get most of his backstory and most of his present torture. And I I really like the way Ellison with Nimdok, because that Nazi Holocaust stuff is completely new to the game. Right. Um, and also Nimdok's name, also, is just like, in the short story it mentioned that, oh, that's just a fake name that Am made for his own amusement. Yeah, I don't remember. Like, Am's kind of immature. No, yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's like Am is Am is fucking crazy, yeah. which kind of comes through. And what I like about the game actually is um, all of Am's dialogue. I think totally works. Like every time he speaks, I I really I can't say I like the character, but he's kind of funny in a horrible way. In the game? Yeah, in the game actually. Okay. Now, I think that was. I mean, Ellison voiced it obviously, and I think a lot of the dialogue was his. Um, there's a scene that, um, I'll talk about in a bit, I'm planning to let's play this, but, um, where you can talk to Am as Benny in a video screen. It's the only time that he ever talks directly to one of the characters, and he says, like, oh, Benny, you're too weak to, like, eat or whatever, maybe until one of the villagers are tied up, maybe then you could. Who loves you, baby? Like, he says, like, crazy, like, <laughs> weird idiomatic things like that. that kind Trying of, to bring in 60s slang into the mix. Yeah, like, he, he really is kind of fucking nuts, you know? And it kind of works. Harlan Ellison eternally lives in 1967 when he wrote this. <laughs> More or less, basically. Um, no, but I'm sorry, we were going with the short story. Um, what I like better about the short story than the game is Ted's a paranoid, and it's very, I can't say subtly, but it's not just given to you. In the game, they out and out say, like, Am says, like, I made you a paranoid, Ted. But in the short story, he, you, you kind of just pick it up because he's like, well, they all hate me because I'm the one who's least changed by him. Not me, you know, that kind of right. thing. Well, in the game, it was like, Ted, you're paranoid. Enjoy your new life. <laughs> Here's your castle where you get to have, have some fun. fun. Exactly. <laughs> but that's the thing, like, he says he's paranoid, but doesn't seem particularly afraid of anything in the, you know what I mean? It doesn't follow. Right. Um, the, the best thing I can give Ted in the video game is I feel like his his adventure was actually supposed to be like a perverted version of an adventure game, like fucked up King's Quest, in a way. 
you can't save the princess, you can only let her die and go to heaven. I don't really get the religious allegory either, but whatever, it's there. Or just kill her yourself. Well, that, no, that was Gorister, right, where he had to kill himself. No, I mean, you kill her yourself. Oh, yeah. Like yeah, in yeah. the short story, yeah. Well, she, but you know, she's dying in the game, right? I'm talking about the short story. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in the short story, yeah, you, like, I mean, he, he kills her, right. And he kills, um, he kills Benny and Gorister, Ellen kills Nimdok, and then, if I remember correctly, yeah, Ted kills Ellen, and then... And yeah, and Ted him. tries to kill himself, but Anne stops him somehow before he's able to do that. Right. And then turns him, this is where it very much differs from the game, turns Ted into, like, a gelatinous creature. Well, actually, no. Um, that no? is the bad ending to the game. Oh! Yeah, if you... So, um, I was gonna show this off in the long play somehow, but, um... If you fuck up the endgame sequence and one of them is left alive, Anne will catch them and turn them into the gelatinous creature. Oh. I never showed you that. I don't recall seeing a gelatinous creature. We're going to have to do a special ending video, I think. Okay. Okay. Fair yeah. No, it, it's um, it's it, it's interesting because what happens is each character then has a little sort of epilogue and they each say a line from the last paragraph or so, you know? Where they're talk, where Ted's talking about being the gelatinous creature, you know, like Nimdok says something like, you know, uh, what is it like, inside the belly of Am, who we created because our time was badly spent and we know he could have done it better, you know what I mean, that kind of thing, and then like they all like say a line from it more or less is the idea. Okay. And Cyber Dreams, I think, did a good job um, on that. You know, the gelatinous creature does look. Very well done. We gotta do a video. I guess we gotta do a video. Do you know that Cyber Dreams reused part of the soundtrack from Dark Seed 2 in I Have No Mouth? You know, it's funny. I never recognized that until they mentioned it in YouTube. But once the same, day, yeah, I yeah, realized yeah. It. Yeah, 27 minutes in. Fun little Easter egg. Which came first? Um, Dark Seed 2. It went, their, their game series went Dark Seed, Dark Seed 2, I Have No Mouth, and then Noir, which I've never played or seen. And then Bioshock Infinite. And then Bioshock Infinite, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Are we ready to transition to that from your perspective, or...? Actually, can I just throw out the one idea I had about I Have No Mouth? Well, you had lots of ideas about I Have No Mouth. Well, I mean, I sent you a document I wrote up, because I've been thinking a lot about the game, and I was like, you know what, for all my criticism stuff, maybe one money where the mouth is, where my mouth is, how would I fix it if, if I'm so great at adventure game shit and all that, you know? Yeah, and that's the thing with I Have No Mouth, like, it has a lot of ideas, but due to the time that it was made... It's constricted a lot by... I just feel like if you took the people at Cyber Dreams who thought this idea up and had the bold vision to say, let's take this really fucking depressing thing and try to make it into a dark, awesome video game, but then gave it to a designer from LucasArts who fucking got how to make adventure games like fun and interesting, that would have been incredible. Like, just Cyber Dreams, judging from Dark Sea 1 and 2, all the things wrong with I Have No Mouth, I feel like, are their fault. Mostly Moloch, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's just wondering, like, with 20 years of hindsight in adventure game design, how would you fix it? And that's kind of where I had tried a Let's Play video in the Sandcastle. It didn't go so well if I have no mouth. And now I was thinking of trying it again with a new perspective of, okay, how would you fix it? How would you make the puzzles better? What's wrong? You know? And I have a lot of crazy ideas, but, you know. So I have no mouth mobile app coming out soon, <laughs> maybe? You know, no joke. I, I noticed that there is a port of Scum VM to uh, uh, to the yeah, iPhone, but you need Scum your Scum VM. Oh um, yeah. So it, um, if you want to play event, old adventure games in a modern sense, there's an engine called Scum VM, and it stands for Script Creation uh, Script Creation Utility for Maniac Mansion. Is the old Lucas Arts? Um, remember Maniac Mansion was like oh, the yeah, first. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So that was the engine they sort of built a lot of their games on. So someone made Scum VM, which is the Scum Virtual Machine, and they recreated all the Lu well, most of the LucasArts games on it. And then they recreated, I think, Dark Seed One, and I think I Have No Mouth, which is how I played it for the long play. And I actually tried using a Scum decompiler on it to see some of the script and stuff like that. Um, I forget where I was going with this. They can't. They can't redo Dark Seed Two apparently. There's just something about it. That's well, a that's a shame, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Damn you! They couldn't quite explain everything to put that together. <laughs> I noted when I was reading the short story, I was kind of keeping an eye out for any 
any references that the game may have made to the short story. I only found one quote that stood out, or one, like, part that stood out. It was when uh, he wrote, Burning neon pillar rammed into soft brain matter. Mm-hmm. Oh, and yeah. In the game, there was that fire pillar where Chinese Am and Russian Am were hanging out. And I thought, oh, maybe that's where they got the idea from that from. Well, oh, good call, good call. Um, the big one, uh, well, there's a few for me, and I think there's a lot of food stuff in the short story that I think would have right, worked for, better uh, in Benny Scenario. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. You talk about the frozen mammoth, the canned goods. like right. And how he went kind of crazy when he couldn't open the can. He was trying to throw it against the ice. Exactly. And I think you could have done so much more with that in this scenario. But it's only mentioned offhandedly. You know? Yeah, well, in the game, like, Benny's very... He still has his intellect intact. Yeah. Well, <laughs> one of the things I wanted to bring up, too, if you, and I never noticed this until recently. If you look at his sprite, if you look at the character portrait, Benny's got this weird collar and it looks like a tie almost, right? But it, it's actually supposed to be a, like a cerebral sort of mental implant or whatever. It's very hard to look, like if you look at the character portrait, it's like one row of pixels. And if you're really looking at the the sprite itself, he has a thing running up his back. And I guess what I'm reading from that artwork is that Benny's brain is so damaged that like for Am to repair it, he's got to like add this thing extra to him, you know. Because Benny's still not smart in his scenario, per se. He can like, think and understand things now a little better. He can't speak. Well, that's the of course. You know, but, um... Well, at any rate, you know, my, my big problem with Benny's scenario is they keep he pays a lot of lip service to how hungry he is and how starving he is and how much he wants to eat, but it never really goes anywhere. And you don't actually... The only time you have to eat is just on the first day to go to sleep to advance the story to the lottery. It, it never really comes into play. Um, and that was part of where your ideas came from for how to fix at least that part of the game. Exactly. Was bringing in that hunger mechanic more. Exactly. Like, there's a deleted scene, um, and if you YouTube and look for I Have No Mouth Deleted Scene, Benny can eat a baby. Um, all the characters have this scene that's supposed to be so gruesome, they show it in shadows. It's you know, Ellen getting attacked in the elevator, it's Nimdok being killed by the golem, which we do see in the long play. Um, Ted being eaten by wolves, blah, blah, blah. Benny doesn't have one, but originally, yeah, he apparently could actually eat a live baby. Um, and so I guess Cyber Dreams was like, Holocaust, rape, those things, fine, but yeah, we can't have him eat a baby, that's too mm -hmm. much. Let's put the line somewhere, guys. Exactly. But yeah, that's, that's, I think I think bringing his hunger mechanic to the forefront could have really made for some more interesting gameplay. So yeah, I wrote a document about it, and then when I, I sent it to you, I, you know, you mentioned that maybe you could use some more visual aids, so I'm like, maybe that's the direction I want to go with this Let's Play, is like... Let's all just play amateur adventure game designer and talk about how we do it differently, or even if things are broken to begin with. I think that'd make for it. a good thread too. I think that's I think not so only too. you with your ideas, but also other people chipping in. That's exactly it. Because I, I like I have like ideas like you know when Benny takes the fruit off the tree. Um, why don't you make it? I mean, I know this is cliche, but too high up for him to reach, so you solve a puzzle just to find out the fruit's inedible anyway, and then. You say from there, like, okay, well, if that can stave off Benny's hunger, what if you don't do that? And then what if the fruit doesn't regenerate? What if you can... I, I don't know. I have ideas. I'm just saying that, like, I think it could make for some interesting discussion and say, well, how? what kind of puzzle could you build around that? What ways could Amp taunt him? And one other thing can I just add real quick before we move on? Because we spent... Um, I think the one good thing about Benny's scenario is it's the one where Am interacts directly with the character and the player, and... He's got great dialogue and stuff. I think making him a more active antagonist in all the scenarios really would have added something to the game. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. Because in the short story, he was a very active antagonist. Absolutely. That kept things moving. Yeah, absolutely. You, you, you didn't like him. You felt bad for all of them and shit. Here, he just in the game, he just kind of sets up the intros and outros. And that's kind of all he does, you know? Yeah, I mean, in 1967, very powerful computer. When are you going to make an app that will make people immortal? <laughs> Well, I mean, we are kind of almost 50 years behind the times, man. I'm sorry, but according to the game, you, we invented that serum in 1945. Thanks, Nazis. Oh, yes, 1945. <laughs> my favorite year. The, the year I sent all the computer passwords to 1945. The year I went into Brainland. 
<laughs> Someone mentioned, by the way, we sound like Tommy Wiseau when we do, we do the German <laughs> Mindog voice. I don't know. Oh, hi, Am. <laughs> How are you today? Can I say one other thing, by the way? I know I had this idea that we webcam each other to act off each other, but I am barely looking at you this whole time. Yeah, it totally didn't work. I'm sorry. No, uh, one thing that I've noticed that some other gaming podcasts do is that they take the... They actually record the webcam, webcam footage and put them on, like, corners of the YouTube screen... But I can't see how that is not disconcerting for people who watch it, because it's just bodiless faces staring into your soul, talking at you. Well, tell me if I'm wrong here, just judging by seeing you on the Skype call. Your camera, your webcam, or, or, no, I'm sorry, the window where you can see me is to your lower right? No, the window where I can see you is above me, and is bigger than mine. Oh, because you keep looking down into my left, and I don't know why. It's like you're looking over uh, at... At my at my bed for some reason, it's weird. <laughs> Let's not read into that. Okay. Yeah, but my camera is is pointed straight at me because Mac. So I'm I'm probably looking a little above you right now. Yeah, I have a separate uh, detachable webcam above my monitor. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, and my Skype is to my right, so if I want to actually look at us in action, <gasps> I can see us right there. Dear God, I can see me, and then I can see you. Just a little inside look into Retsupre. Did we really spend half an hour talking about an old short story? <laughs> I think so. All right. It was written in 1967, right? So, finally about time to bring it into the conversation. <laughs> it's awesome. a hell of a computer, though. Can make people immortal, can, but can't bring them back from the dead, was the... Uh, Cl was cloning, the cloning wasn't a thing back then, you know? Right. So there's that. Yeah, so we <laughs> right. did that. Um, so I, I had a transition statement a while ago about Bioshock Infinite. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I just finished that game. Yeah. I've yet to play it, but plan to as soon as I finish Sleeping Dogs. Whoa. Because Which... I only play games that are at least several months old. Who should go first, friend? I think Bioshock Infinite's infinitely more interesting. Oh, dear. Um, Bioshock Infinite is very different. No, from... no spoilers, by the way. No, no spoilers. Don't worry. Um, Bioshock Infinite is very different from the other Shock games. The other Shock games, well, System Shock especially, and I'm watching Psychedelic Eyeballs, completely awesome Let's Play of System Shock 2. They're apparently survival horror in a very well done sense. There's more inventory management, more RPG elements, and it's kind of more about scarce resor resource management while horrible things are going on. The audio design is well done. It's very frightening and topical. I mean, I've heard people talk up System Shock 2 a lot in my gaming life. <laughs> um, but uh, Psych, Psych is definitely showing off a very cool look at it, and I kind of get how it's very creepy. I don't know if you've kept up with that thread at all. I've seen the first, like, four or five videos. Okay. So I've got the basic setting of it down, but I haven't gotten too far into it. Right. So Bioshock, um, a lot of people call watered down System Shock too. I, I like Bioshock a lot. I don't. I don't feel that way. Um, I, I kind of get it now, seeing System Shock two. That said, I think it was still kind of a, a. How do I put this? I think it was kind of a neat way to introduce modern gamers who may not want to hang around and do all the resource management shit of S System Shock two. You know, kind of bring it in real in a, an interesting way. The thing about Bioshock, though, which people may or may not know, is it has this sort of trippy sort of plot with some twists in it, you know, that kind of thing. And System Shock 2 it has a plot twist or two, but not so much. You know, it, it's got it's got better ambiance, ambiance and environment. It's more about know. the setting than... Yeah, you know. The, you can see one thing coming from a mile away. Um, Infinite, though, it's funny because... Judging from the previews and all that, um, is totally different insofar as it's bright and colorful and sort of this crazy open environment as opposed to like Rapture, which is like deep under the sea and you know what I mean? And um, kind of apocalyptic in a way, but then. Right, and then System Shock 2 is like, you know, you're on a dark ship that's alone and taken over. Infinite is like a bustling sort of environment, like a city, you know? And it's it, it's very odd that way uh, compared to the other shock games, I guess you know. Um, it's way more like a first person shooter than the other games. Like way you'll... more of a first person shooter than a first person shooter. Yeah, no. I mean, well, I mean, in Bioshock, you know, you fight the splicers. They're 
a lot of them are melee attackers. You have turrets, you have the big daddies, don't get me wrong. But right. it, it's more about, like, sneaking up and using your wrench and, like, uh, uh, you know, conserving ammo and stuff. This one, though, you get more swarmed by projectile fighting people. It's not like a modern warfare, don't get me wrong, but it, it, it's it's definitely more action-packed than the other ones, right? Gotcha, yeah. Um, and then there's Elizabeth, which I have to bring up. You had a lot of tweets about uh, about that relationship. Everyone in the fucking video game world and on Twitter and Facebook, they fucking love Elizabeth. And she's not bad, don't get me wrong. I like her. But, like, here's, okay, here's, here's the big disconnect with Elizabeth. Um, when you meet her, her head is enormous. <laughs> like, it's enormous. The reason is because you're so used to other NPCs in the game with normal-sized heads, and then you meet her alone, and you're like, holy shit, it's like a watermelon. What the fuck? Hey, that's enough body shaming, slow beef. Oh, excuse me. Head hey. shaming. Head shaming, to be fair. Head shaming, yeah. Right. Now, later in the game, you see her with another NPC, and it's like, okay, her head's only a little bit bigger. And I think the, I think the notion is, when you see so many normal head people in the game, and then you run on her after seeing no one for a while, you're like, wow, that's huge. I don't get what's going on there. <laughs> that's why the game gets a 2 out of 5. Yeah. She's an okay character. I mean, you don't have to, it's not an escort mission. You don't have to protect her at all. Um... What's kind of stupid is that, like, so her AI is to give you ammo and items and shit randomly. Sure, she throws things at you? Yeah, yeah. And, like, she'll, like, be like, hey, you know, I found something and flip you a coin or something, right? And, like, it doesn't quite work because something horrible happened in the game. And, like, Elizabeth will be like, and I'm just making this up, like, um, I don't know, like, these animals' blood is on our hands. Hey, money! And flips you a coin. And it's like, <laughs> what the fuck? Game mechanics kind of get in the way of characterization to some extent. Yeah, more or less, you know. Yeah, yeah I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't dig her art style, but that said, characterization-wise, she's not so bad. Mm. And game as a whole, recommend? Yes, I would. Worth 60 Beatus bucks? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, I think you'll really like it. Um, mm -hmm. I can't get into plot stuff, but um, I will say I was happy with where the story went. Um... I needed to look some stuff up online at the end because one of the <laughs> things was like, wait, what? You know what I mean? Like those kinds of right. plot movements where you're like, I'm sorry, how does that work? So um, I, I, I don't want to give examples just for whatever. But yeah, I, I totally, I would totally recommend. I, I do you think it's as good as the hype. That's next on my gaming list. Absolutely. It's a beautiful looking game. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks fantastic. Yeah, no, it really is. So that's Sleeping Dogs. Sleeping Dogs is fun. It's it's good. I have some issues with it, but not enough that have uh, kept me playing from it necessarily. But you know, it's like a you know GTA kind of formula, open world game set in Hong Kong. You're an undercover cop mm -hmm. who is infiltrating a triad gang right. to try to bring it down. And you know, you're uh, there's some issues with your character getting too involved, those sorts of things, but it, it's a lot of fun. The story missions and such are pretty interesting. There are some cop missions that you do on the side which are pretty good too. My big beef with it is that there is a pretty bad or pretty limited variety of side mission type stuff. Okay. So, I mean, you could limit it to basically a few categories. There's, you know, you can do some martial arts tournaments to get money, and that's just you, you know, hitting the X button over and over again, pretty much. There are, you know, chase a guy down, beat him up type missions, uh, chase a guy in a car type missions. Mm -hmm. There's just not a whole lot of variety on that front from the non-story related stuff. And it's an open world game, so you kind of hope there would be more of that. And then it, you know, just does the GTA type thing of there's a bunch of hidden bags on the map that you can right. get, but there's not really a whole lot of incentive to get those. Like some bags have hidden uh, clothing items in them that you can pick up, but those are just serve mostly to customize your character. And in some cases, they can give you some nominal bonuses to your stats. But there's other than that, there's not a whole lot of incentive to do it. Like I don't really feel like going out of my way and spending time to get that stuff more than I just want to play the story and kind of see where that goes. I get you. I will say as contrast, I did, I did feel a need to like get all the stuff in Bioshock Infinite because it all felt sort of helpful, mm -hmm. you know? It's like if you collect all the Silver Eagles, you can buy a weapons upgrade at the vending machine and you kind of want to see what they're going to do or get more vigors or blah, 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 you know? 
Um, yeah, but like I never got the whole like dress up your character a little differently kind yeah, of. Thing. Yeah, that's unless, just not my thing. Unless you really fucking love a game, you know. Yeah, I mean, it has some goofy costumes. It has some costumes that are references to other games. For instance, like there's a uh, a, a costume that is a reference to Just Cause Two, which is uh, basically how that character dresses, and it lets you hijack vehicles from a greater distance because it has a little hook shot on it. Okay. Those things, which are kind of neat, but are just kind of... I feel like if a game can rope you in enough, especially the open world kind of games, um, then you'll go seek out those collectibles on their own and damn the reward. So, right. uh, um, Arkham City, I actually did get all the Riddler trophies because I fucking love that game. <laughs> which is, like, by the way, is like crazy. There's like two, three hundred. There's three hundred of them, right? Yeah, it, it got rid of it. I, I admittedly did go to a walkthrough at one point because I was just like, all right, this is getting stupid. Okay. Um, yeah, but I really love that game, so I was like willing to kind of see it all the way through, you know? Sure. I, I think, like, open world games, you really got to get people invested, you know? Yeah, Sleeping Dogs doesn't quite do that. Like, as far as, like, recreating a alternative Hong Kong... It does a pretty good job, but not so much that I want to explore every nook and cranny of it to get bags filled with, like, 5000 bucks. Yeah, I hear that. And that game throws money at you like crazy. <laughs> so you don't ever actually need to go get that money, because you will have plenty of money to buy cars, buy clothes, buy whatever you need. You can, like, customize your apartment. You get, like, four different apartments throughout the uh, the city. But again, it's just... It's just dressing. You know, it's funny that you say that, because I felt like Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, which, when you talk about the Grand Theft Auto 3 games, you know, was easily the most open world of all of them and had the most to do. But yeah. it, it kind of had, like, so much to do that... That's my problem with open world games. That's why I've never played any of the Elder Scrolls games, because it's just... Like, I love what open world games try to do, but it's just too much. I feel like Grand Theft Auto 3 kind of did it best in so far as it wasn't, it was kind of sloppy in a way, but it was like fun sloppy where you could just fuck with the game, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it was just like, you know, I, I, I can't accomplish any missions, fuck it, I'm gonna go get a, see if I can get that five wanted meter star, you know? Yeah. I can't find this uh, bag of stuff, let's just kill a bunch of people. Yeah, exactly. And like, I mean, that's what, Grand Theft Auto 4 I think was, I mean, I liked it a lot in a way, but it was kind of the worst Defender 2, where it's just like, hey, you want to go play darts? It's like, no, I, I don't. That's the stupidest thing yeah. you've ever asked me. Thanks. You know? That's another thing with Sleeping Dogs, is, and don't get me wrong, I really like the game, mm -hmm. but it's an open. it puts you in the sandbox, and, with, and in a sandbox game, it gives you the, the idea of you can do anything you want, damn the consequences. But the context of the game is that you're an undercover cop. And so you do have to abide by some certain rules. <laughs> and those don't matter so much when you're not in a mission, but when you are actually executing a mission, if you, say, steal a car, that deducts you some experience points. Okay. Or if you accidentally kill a guy, that deducts you some experience points. Incidentally, about the same amount of experience points that being clumsy, <laughs> and that is something that deducts you points, either being clumsy or stealing a car is about as bad as killing a guy, an innocent guy. <laughs> In the context of this game. To be fair, it's Hong Kong. I mean, you know. It is Hong Kong, so there is that. But, um, <laughs> but you mean, do have to kind of be... A, you have to tread on eggshells a little bit more when you're playing through missions. Mm -hmm. And in an open world game, that kind of feels limiting, but not, not too much. But it's still kind of like... Eh, yeah, which you. is not an issue in like a Grand Theft Auto sort of situation. But again, the missions and such and the story is interesting enough that it keeps me wanting to play it. It's funny, Bioshock Infinite has these sort of weird nods to... It's a it's a linear game. There's no two ways about it. You know, it, it has these weird nods where it's where like Elizabeth up herself and be like, "Hey, you want to go here? Or you want to go here?" And it's the story. And you're kind of like, "Yeah, you know, I don't want to go. It's the story." Um, like once I think I went over to a side mission, but it was it you know, it was just basically like kill these guys, grab some items, kind of thing. You know what I mean? So it does have side missions. Not really. Like, I'm talking about, like, maybe two or three moments where it's like, do you want to stock up on ammo, or do you want to go continue the story kind of thing? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, it, it, don't get me wrong, it's not a bad game at all or whatever. I mean, but, it, I mean, there's no two ways about it. It's a very linear game. And if you played Bioshock, you, you're, you know what you're in for in that aspect. You know, where they're like, go here, go here, go here. It's not, you Yeah, know. and I'm kind of a fan of more linear games myself. Um, I, I think it depends... I, I like them when they have a story and they want to, um... 
You know what's funny? It reminds me of uh, a game I, I kind of wanted to let's play. It was 24, the game, based on the TV show. Oh, yes. It was such a bad idea, because they tried to model it after Grand Theft Auto, because um, Jack Bauer, and, and he can now commandeer vehicles rather than carjack them, because he's a uh, counter-terrorist unit agent, yeah, right? Flashes a badge and he can have it, yeah. Exactly, but the show, the show takes place in real time, so it's meant to be completely fucking linear, but they try to kind of do open-world stuff. It's just such a failure on so many levels. <laughs> it's such a terrible video game. So that'll be your next Let's Play. Actually, I'm, um, well, um, currently on, for Decathlon's Hard Games Thread, I'm going through Contra 3. That's right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very had to, I'm very glad to defy people's expectations and actually play the game well. Yeah, and you're holding the right button the whole time? Not, not really. Um, the, f and I had to slow down a little on the first stage to give myself some time to talk. I, the first time I, I went through it, I did it in, actually, no joke, 420, like 4 minutes, 20 seconds. Woo! Exactly, yeah, sure. Um, and um, it, it, it went it went by too fast. I had no time to talk about anything, so I <laughs> I purposefully slowed down my gameplay and did it in five minutes. So I, I must hold myself back. I'm too good at this. <laughs> I'm really good at stage one. I will just say that. No, um, I I did witness you play Contra uh, Super Contra at the previous packs. Yeah, and you proved um yeah. First hand that you were quite adept at the game. I played I played through it in high school. Now, so if you if you're interested in Decathlon's Hard Games thread, and it's on my Slow Beef YouTube account, um, I'm playing through it on hard difficulty, no deaths with a keyboard, no gamepad or anything. So, oh. um, I switch configs for the overhead sections. That's my one thing. But you know, um, it, it, it it's really fun actually. It kind of. It, it, it's I don't know. It's interesting to talk about like gameplay mechanics and things like that. So I'm considering going through the Genesis version hardcore after it, or switching to that one Let's Play slash Retsu Prey idea that I mentioned to you. Ah uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll keep that in the barrel just in case. But little something to get you guys excited. Little little merger of ideas, let's say. <laughs> Indeed. Um, but I like I like Dictalon's uh, hard game start a lot. It's a very cool... I mean, the, the title brings it all down. Dictalon's Yeah, awesome. exactly. Yeah. You, you, you talk to him and Figgle on the podcast. I mean, you know, he loves those hard games, mm -hmm. and he's really good at them, so there's that. Well, I think that's the appeal of Let's... Of, at least part of the appeal of Let's Play is seeing games that are difficult for the everyman and seeing them played through like a breeze. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I just like it, too, because it kind of, like, defies that whole stereotype I have that I've built up that I'm terrible at video games, and here's yes. one I'm okay at. Finally, a chance for vindication. Here's the one that I've somehow managed. But, um... <laughs> well, there is that. There is. Um, are you, or you're in the middle of Galaxy 2 right now, right? Still doing Galaxy. Absolutely. You have a ways to go, don't you? I, I do. It's been slower than I thought it would be. The problem is I, I keep wanting to add variety in who I have on. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, like, there are people I have... Like, I want to bring in people that I know to some degree, but then, you know, people are busy. No, that's true, right? So I have, like, ideas for, like, oh, I'll get this dude, or I'll get this dude. It's a combination of, of peeps. Mm -hmm. But then, like, one of them can't be on, so, you know, I'm left in the wind. Yeah, no, I wouldn't know what, like, a whole trilogy of games being Let's Played with guests is like, so, yeah, tough, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, you no. have nothing to add to this conversation. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, um, I think if you... I mean, if you widen the pool or whatever, maybe, and post in the thread and be like, who yeah. wants to jump in? That's possible. But then, you, of course, you run the risk of the bad guest. Well, that was one thing I was thinking about, actually, and this is kind of a nice segue into our next uh, next part of our podcast discussion, is um, when we were doing the stream, and I was, oh, just, yeah. Bring, yeah, I was just bringing in random people, and uh, right. for the context of people who aren't aware. So we did a stream, a uh, live stream... Late last week, Thursday and Friday, it was to benefit. It was a charity stream for, uh, for Boston, for the people who had been impacted by the events there, and so we had provided a couple links. We said, "Hey, uh, donate if you want to." We're just kind of, kind of bullshit around, uh, you know, donate if you like, whatever. And then, kind of as a, as a not really incentive, we said, like, "Hey, if you send me a receipt, we'll bring you into a Skype call for a few seconds. You can chat and hang out or whatever." Right. We we uh, we streamed Dead to Rights too. Right. 
And, um, which is a game people have asked for the Let's Play ever. And ever. Which is the perfect choice for a charity stream, <laughs> really. More or less. Makes so, perfect yeah. sense. Yeah, and we brought people into the Skype call. And, yeah, uh, but, you know, pretty much all of the people that we brought in were really cool. Yeah. Really nice to talk to. They all had something neat to say. So it made me think, like, you know, I could probably bring people like this into the Galaxy thread, and it would be fine. Absolutely. I don't need to, you know, just limit it to my own circle of Let's Pals. But kind of, you know, broaden it a little bit, and it would be fine. I would still recommend just bringing one person just on the off chance that you know, or, sure, you know what I mean? Sure. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but all in all, I mean, most people, like, all of our fans are great, and all of them are very fun. No, um... Put down the script, slowly. <laughs> <laughs> you can plainly see I don't have one, and that was rote memorization. Oh, my God. Uh, um... No, 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 absolutely. Um... I, uh, uh, where we're going with this? I... I no idea. <laughs> Where are we going no. with this podcast, really? What are we doing? I have no idea. I don't know. But I think um, the total... Well, the first the first day we did it, Proton John helped us out a lot. He tested out the yeah. stream with us and um, apparently stayed on in, like, total pe things. And apparently um, our fans, like, donated, like, $3,500 or whatever. Yeah, I mean, that's estimated. just... That's an estimate at best. Yeah. And, and an educated estimate. But yeah. still, that is, like, that really defied our expectations for it. I think, I remember we talked about it at work and stuff, and it's just like, you know, you feel bad about the scenario and you want to help out, and it's just like, well, the obvious answer is to use Let's Play for that. But, um, <laughs> no, I, 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 I don't know. It was, it was, it was fun. I mean, it, I don't think fun is the right word. It's just, it was very cool in a way. I don't want to sound like patting yourself on the back kind of thing. I don't mean sure. it that way. Because we contributed nothing. You know, it was just every everybody who was, like, an RP fan or whatever. Yeah. And, and you know what I like, too, is that um, in the past couple of podcasts, uh, not the past couple, but in the couple of them, we've been like, hey, don't bug people on YouTube, blah, 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 and all this downer kind of shit about our audience. And this was, like, this completely awesome, positive thing that everybody did. So it, it, was, a, it was really nice. I, I It really meant a lot. I told my in-laws about it. That's how... <laughs> that was Why did you get time. some brownie points? <laughs> That was the whole goal of this, wasn't it? <laughs> well, to get you in their good graces. My father-in-law told my brother-in-law and uh, his fiance just like, ah, you gotta hear what, uh, not my, obviously, Floe Beef did, you know what I mean, or whatever. Is this like, Yankee Am we're talking about? <laughs> yes, it is, actually. Uh, okay. <laughs> but, um, no, it was really cool. We should, we, we said we were going to do part three, which is, it's been my fault. I, I have, like, my final coming up and all yeah, that yeah, yeah. stuff, so. Yeah, we're planning on doing a little bit more. Uh, I, I think one Another more charity just, thing. Maybe we'll just link up the Dead to Rights to, because there was two parts, you know, maybe in one video, or maybe we'll do something else, I don't know. Yeah. We'll decide something. But again, that that was all you guys. That was that was really great. Mm -hmm. you know? Thanks a lot. Yeah. A lot of cool people showed up, so we're very uh, very appreciative of that. Absolutely. And but thanks to you, by the way, for mostly taking charge of that insofar as, like, good commentary and stuff, because... No, it was fun to do, and you know, for for you know, purely selfish reasons, you know, trying to expand the base of people, you know, I try to bring into calls, talk to, or whatever, you know, guest praise things that I haven't really done before. Uh, you took a break in the middle of one stream, so I talked to a lot of people one on one, and you know, it was it was fun. No, yeah, the second stream, I just I couldn't uh, toward the end. Yeah, you we were did. blitzed slash bushed. Well, no, that was the first one. <laughs> the first well, one both, was, both of them, really. Yeah, basically. basically. Well, one, one, first one was blitzed, second one was bushed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the second one was, like, kind of hungover and, like... I, okay, uh, yeah. And I spent the whole day, like, moving shit in, in my house and all that uh, stuff. Right, so right, I was right. just like, I, I can't do this, I gotta go to bed. But, like, <laughs> yeah. No, the first one was we were drinking while doing... I had no mouth and I was screaming, you know. <laughs> and then... And then in the middle of Dead to Rights 2, I'm like, I could go for another one. And it's like, oh, no, I'm... And that's, that was it. That was it. <laughs> that's that's what Am did to Nimdok, more or less. <laughs> right. The story, basically. What what else do we have? I don't know. I don't know. Um. Nothing. We're out. We're done. Nothing. That's it. Video games are awesome. Yeah. Stay tuned for. Uh, people have asked a lot about King's Quest Seven. Oh yeah yeah yeah. We will. we uh, we haven't given up on that. It's just it's difficult. I, I personally consider that next in the pipe, though. Yeah. I, th yeah. I think let's just get it out of the way. I'm with you. Yeah. And I like the idea of bringing in a random person for each section of it that we do. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. So we had, you know, we had Proton John, we had Psychedelic Eyeball, so we can bring in some other folks. 
Absolutely. To help us spice things up a little bit. Because we're it. really, really boring people. <laughs> Anything to plug? Anything to plug? Uh, watch Galaxy. If uh, if you haven't done that yet, let's play of it. It's on something awful. I have a YouTube page, IBSRP. Follow me on Twitter at the Beatus. I tweet terrible jokes every now and then about games or other such stuff. Oh, um, one thing I should say. Um, yeah. I um, I've owned RedSupray.com for a bit. I finally pointed it at Slowbeef.com. My website got wiped out, so I'm in the process of bringing it back up. Um, I have so much other shit to do that it's going to be a bit. But um, we're going to have something like a website at some point. So be, stay tuned. Be excited. I guess. No, I mean, just, just somewhere to go or whatever. We could like put our Tumblr shit and link all crap like that on there, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, that said, you know, again, I'm doing Contra 3 for the Hard Game Thread. YouTube users Slow Beef. Slow Beef Twitter. Blah, blah, blah. Who cares? And that, as they say, is that. Indeed. I think. I think. <laughs>